There are three things inextricably linked to the first hundred years Europeans settled in New Zealand. Gold, sheep, and whiskey. Hooch. Gut rock. Grog. The demon drink. Firewater. Whiskey was the predominant tipple in New Zealand for a good century or more, only losing that mantle to beer after World War II. For all that time, illegal whisky consumption went hand in hand with the legitimate. Hokonui in gore now tends to attract most of the thunder when the subject of moonshining or sly grogging is broached. Sly grogging being a term unique to Australia and New Zealand. Moonshining entering the English vernacular in about 1785 as a term for smuggled white brandy. Bootlegging occurred everywhere in New Zealand from 1840 through to the 1940s. To give this some perspective as to this historic scope of a list operation, let's just look at a few of them. Trust me, there are way more. And if I forget to mention the one that your old uncle ran in the bush out the back of your place, it was only because I wanted to keep this video less than 60 minutes. 1860s, Stewart Island. 1883, Palmerston North. 1885, Woodville. 1896, Pahiatua. 1898, Hastings. 1903, Thames. 1904, Ashburton. 1909, Wahi. 1909 again, Wellington. 1922, Nelson. 1927, Auckland. 1928, Southland. 1937, lastly, Christchurch. The Uruweras and the West Coast get an honourable mention. With it came social ills and the invariable kickback. One of the first acts of Governor Hobson in 1841 was to outlaw the distillation of hard liquor in New Zealand. This embargo of locally manufactured spirits remained in place till 1865. Then it pitted local distilleries against the imported product. The new immigrants from Scotland and Ireland certainly knew their dram, and it was fair to say most of the whisky that first arrived in New Zealand and was brewed here wasn't of a high quality, and thus further fueling the bush whisky market. A clandestine still in the back blocks also been a part of the fabric of life for the Irish and Scots. Sparsely occupied, bush laden New Zealand was a moonshiner's dream. The average policeman also had a laissez faire attitude towards enforcement. When you were the sole copper for 25 miles, it didn't pay to make enemies with a sizable chunk of the population. It was also a tough life for many people in the mid-1800s and getting drunk was for all intents and purposes one of life's only pleasures. As the economy grew, whisky boozers were increasingly looked down upon by the burgeoning middle and upper classes. Another factor that saw hostility grow against alcohol was the growing influence of the female voting bloc. New Zealand woman being the first to get the vote in 1893. They would rather their men folk were at home and not down at the pub with their mates, 
often single men. There was at that time a large imbalance between males and females, and their cries along with those from the puritanical fire and brimstone Victorian preachers saw the first of four local prohibition referendums occur a year later in 1894. Like the next three, 1902, 1905 and 1908, this referendum took place on a local district basis, the modern equivalent of local body elections. To go dry, 60% of the votes had to support prohibition. The first to do so was Clutha in 1884, then followed Matara, incorporating Gore, and then Invercargill. Gore District was under strict prohibition between 1902 and 1957. If you ever wondered why Southland was the epicentre of the illegal moonshine operations in New Zealand, you now have the reason. A perfect example of unintended consequences, bottled with a label to match. Illegal liquor sales in the dry districts boomed. Moderate drinkers were forced onto the black market. The year before the first districts opted for breaches of the distillation laws, there were a total of only nine prosecutions. Three years later, those prosecutions had ballooned to 72. New Zealand held its first of two national referendums, incumbent on the whole country going dry, in 1911. The bar for that one was still being set at two-thirds for it to pass into law. Still, pun intended, the result was a close-run thing. 56% for prohibition and 42 against. The second one occurred in April 1914. That was a head-to-head -head, and as you can see, to your horror, the provisional return indicated a win to the Wowsers. Only the 40,000 special votes could now save the whole country going dry. Those votes were largely cast by troops away on duty in World War I. When these were counted, 32,000 soldiers voted to keep the pubs open. You can do your maths and see their votes made the difference. Another interesting sideline fact is New Zealand held 37 nationwide referendums between 1900 and 2000, and 24 of those were about alcohol, from opening hours through to the legal age. In accordance with the subject matter, there was plenty of titillating morsels to come to light within my research. Along with it, one of the main reasons Moonshiner's days were numbered. As if to highlight the country's preference for whisky over the other forms of alcohol, the steamer Moray Shire, pictured, arrived in the country in March of 1907 out of Liverpool. On board were 20,000 cases of Scottish whisky. Bear in mind each case had 12 bottles, so you're talking about 240,000 bottles in total. At the time, the country had just hit seven figures, so that consignment alone was enough to supply one in four Kiwis a bottle of Highland nectar, man, woman and child. What's more, on the Moray Shire's manifest was also a further thousand casts of whisky as well. If Google is correct, each barrel held approximately 200 litres, so that was another 200,000 litres on just one sailing. The sheer accessibility to cheap quality whisky spelt the doom for commercial bush brewers, as did the changing palate of Kiwi drinkers. Beer was becoming the nation's staple. Moonshiner's other weakness was storage. The distilling process was the easy bit, as was finding a ready market, which often included pubs. Storing, bottling and transporting the end product was the more problematic side of the business. For example, a remote spot like the appropriately named Whiskey Gully at the base of the Blue Mountains that was roughly 15 kilometres from the nearest township to transport the product. 
the most vulnerable time to get collared. For any fit whisky fiends, there are rumoured to be two huge halls of moonshine treasure troves abandoned in the bush of the South Island awaiting discovery. Both stories roughly follow the same pattern. The police discover the operation and take away the stool and what they believe has been manufactured, unaware the bulk of the operation has been secreted away, then forgotten. Legend number one is Mabel Bush in Southland, where the constant threat of police attention led one distiller to cease operations, bury two kegs, only forget in which location you actually buried them in. Legend number two allegedly took place near Akaroa at Pigeon Bay, where a group ran a fish smokehouse as a front for their illicit operations. At some stage they got the wind, the cops were onto them, and each member of the group thought it was the other member that narked on them. Under a drunken cloud of acrimony, they decided to hide their stash in a cave. Only when the cops' interest blew over, and they got sober, they also forgot exactly where their cubby hole was. And so that's it folks, I hope you enjoyed this project as much as I did, and if you've got a good tale, please put it in the comments. Subscribing and liking also helps my one person research and production team to get the channel's videos pushed up the YouTube algorithm. I will spot you next time. Thanks for tuning in to Interesting Things.